Hello, everyone. Welcome to our third session of the Church Planning Training Program. Uh, today, what we're going to be covering is what is a Calvary Chapel. Uh, we're going to look at our philosophy of ministry as well as our theology, and we're going to cover various topics as to what are our core values, what is our DNA. I think many of you are aware that uh, there is a group of churches that decided to get off course, to take a different path than what we are going over now, and that is called the Calvary Global Network. For New Beginnings, for Calvary Chapel New Beginnings uh, and our campus churches, we are part of the Calvary Chapel Association. And so this is what we believe. And so I want you to truly uh, understand that, uh, that you are part of this Calvary Chapel movement that started with Calvary with Pastor uh, Chuck Smith. And we remain faithful to the, uh, again, the distinctives that he set forth for us. And I uh, just want you to be fully aware of that because if you ever decide to take a different course, we can part ways, we'll remain as brothers, but uh, we definitely uh, want you to understand that for us, this is what we believe, okay? And with that, let's go ahead and get started with the statement of faith. And before we go there, let me read to you because there's a number of items or a number of important topics and uh, just statements that he makes here that I think are essential before we get into the uh, Calvary Chapel Statement of Faith. And it says there, one of our stated goals is to establish churches that are associated theologically, philosophically, and relationally. By identifying our philosophy of ministry and theology, we communicate what we believe and why we believe it. These, are core value, these core values are essential to transmitting the DNA of a Calvary Chapel Church. Remember our DNA, these are the distinctives. This is what Pastor Chuck taught us, and we will remain faithful to this at New Beginnings. He goes on to say, these core values are slow to change and remain constant in their influence. We are passionate about these values and care deeply about them. I believe you sense that as I was sharing with you, uh, Calvary Chapel, uh, New Beginnings with Calvary Chapel Association and not part of the Calvary Global Network. Associations, as it says there, seek to establish accountability through relationship rather than exercising control as in a denominational model. Again, we are not a denomination. We are non-denomination a non-denomination church, and so again, we are part of this association. It says, our values drive our churches towards particular destination or model. Associated leaders will seek to meet regularly to create and maintain accountability and to encourage development of healthy churches. Core values determine a church's ministry, distinctive, communicate priorities, inspire action, enhance leaders, influence the ministry's character, contribute to success and create the church's culture. Ultimately, anyone who desires to participate relationally in this type of association must agree with the theology and philosophy of ministry as described. Okay, we mentioned this again. I just want to make sure that we are clear on this, that we must agree with the theology and the philosophy of ministry as described. And so this is what we do at New Beginnings. This is what all our campus churches do. We agree with this philosophy of ministry as well as this theology. So let's go ahead and talk about the Calvary Chapel Statement of Faith. What I'm going to do is uh, many of the points that are mentioned here in this manual are incorporated already in our Statement of Faith. And so I want to make sure that, uh, that I give you our Statement of Faith, which is exactly what's here with some additions and uh, nothing that, uh, that again, that is uh, contrary to, to Calvary Chapel, but I just want to make sure that you are understanding that I am reading our statement of faith. And the first has to do with God. We believe that there is one true God, eternally existing in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, equal in nature, power, and glory, this triune God created all, upholds all, and governs all. And then uh, there are some scriptures there. I'm not going to go over the scriptures. If you want to know what our, our statement of faith is, you can always go on our website. And this is what I'm really, uh, this is what I'm communicating to you here. Next, we're going to look at our statement of faith when it comes to the Bible. 
It says, we believe that the scriptures consisting of the Old and New Testament are the word of God fully inspired without error and the infallible rule of faith and practice. The word of God is a foundation upon which this church operates and is a basis for which the church is governed. We believe that the word of God supersedes any earthly law contrary to the Holy Scriptures. Next, uh, we're going to talk about the Father, God the Father in our statement of faith. What we believe, it says, we believe in the person of God the Father, an infinite, eternal, personal spirit, perfect in holiness, wisdom, power, and love, that he concerns himself mercifully in the affairs of men that he hears and answers prayer, and that he saves from sin and death all those who come to him through Jesus Christ. Next, I'm going to give you our statement of faith when it comes to Jesus himself. We believe in the person of Jesus Christ, God's only begotten Son, fully God and fully human, and conceived by the Holy Spirit. We believe in his virgin birth, sinless life, miracles, teachings, his substitutionary atoning death, bodily resurrection, ascension into heaven, perpetual intercession for his people and personal and visible return to earth. Next, we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit, what our statement of faith is regarding the Holy Spirit. We believe in the person of the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit, who came forth from the Father and Son to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. He came to regenerate, sanctify, seal, and empower for ministry all who believe in Christ. We believe the Holy Spirit indwells every believer in Jesus Christ and that he is an abiding helper, teacher, comforter, and guide. We believe in the present ministry of the Holy Spirit and in the exercise of all biblical gifts of the Spirit as instructed in his word. Next, we're going to talk about the topic of humanity, what we believe when it comes to humanity. Our statement of faith says, uh, uh, states, we believe that all people are sinners by nature and choice and therefore are under condemnation. We are all born sinners. It goes on to say that God imparts life by the Holy Spirit to those who repent of their sins and confess Jesus Christ as Lord. Our statement of faith regarding the church. We believe in the universal church, the living spiritual body of which Christ is the head. And all who are born again are part of the body of Christ. There's a couple of ordinances that we believe when it comes to our statement of faith. It reveals that we believe that Jesus Christ instituted two ordinances for the church. Full immerse, immerse, uh, immersive water baptism of believers. And number two, the Lord's Supper. We believe that Jesus Christ validated the ordinance of marriage also. Okay? Next topic is eschatology. What we believe, what is our statement of faith on eschatology? We believe in the second coming of Jesus Christ, which is his personal, visible return to earth and the establishment of his millennial kingdom in the resurrection of the body, the final judgment and eternal blessing of the righteous and endless separation of the wicked. What do we believe when it comes to eternity? We believe in a literal heaven and a literal hell. And that all those who, who place their faith, hope, and trust in Jesus Christ will spend eternity in heaven with the Lord, while those who reject Jesus' free gift of salvation will spend eternity separated from the Lord. When it comes to the tribulation, what do we believe when it comes to the great tribulation? Let me share with you that we believe in the pre-tribulation rapture of the church where all believers will meet the Lord in the air and be taken out of this world prior to the tribulation that will come upon the earth. And as we've been teaching, I truly believe that this is going to happen in our lifetime. It will be happening very soon. What do we believe when it comes to gender, sexuality, and marriage? Well, our statement of faith states that we believe in the creation and God as a creator. We believe that God created man and that he created them male and female. As such, he created them differently so as to complement and complete each other. God instituted monogamous marriage between male and female as the foundation of the family 
and the basic structure, structure of human society. For this reason, homosexuality and all other sexual preferences or orientations are unnatural, sinful, and unacceptable to God. Accordingly, this ministry here at Calvary Chapel New Beginnings will not perform any marriage ceremonies between two individuals of the same sex. It will not condone or recognize some, uh, I'm sorry, it will not condone or recognize such same-sex marriages, civil unions, or domestic partnerships, even if the state passes law that provide for recognition of such unions. We believe that marriage is exclusively the legal union of one genetic male and one genetic female, sanctioned by the state and evidenced by a marriage ceremony. We also believe that legitimate biblical sexual relations are exercised solely within marriage. Hence, sexual activities such as, but not limited to, adultery, fornication, premarital sex, incest, polygamy, homosexuality, transgenderism, bisexuality, cross-dressing, pedophilia, and bestiality are inconsistent with the teachings of the Bible and the church. Further, lascivious behavior, the creation viewing, the creation viewing and or distribution of pornography and e efforts to alter one's physical gender or gender related appearance are incompatible with a true biblical witness. And then we have the appropriate scriptures that validate our position and why we believe what we believe. Finally, I'm going to give you what we believe when it comes to our culture. We at Calvary Chapel New Beginning seek to worship and serve the Lord within the context of our culture. Yet we recognize that the culture must conform to the scriptures, not the scriptures to the culture. So we place great importance on the exposition of scriptures and a specific emphasis on a verse by verse, chapter by chapter teaching through the entire Bible. We believe that the book of Acts, as well as the epistles of the New Testament, gives us the principles by which this church is to function. The scriptures place a high moral standard on those who would be ministers of the gospel. Therefore, we expect moral and ethical integrity among those with whom we fellowship. And we reserve the right to disfellowship any who become doctrinally aberrant, philosophically incompatible or morally compromised. And so that is our statement of faith. Again, you can get the statement of faith as you look in our website, uh, Calvary Chapel New Beginnings. Uh, you can see it all there so that you have this for yourself. And we have this for everyone to see what we at Calvary Chapel New Beginnings what our statement of faith is, what we stand by, what is our core values. And so uh, as we talked about the statement of faith, let's move on now to the Calvary Chapel movement. The second section here in uh, as we look at what is a Calvary Chapel church. This history is, is you can see it, well, it was once there. I don't know if it's still there at the CCM website. And it is used by permission, but in the 60s, just to give you a brief history, in the 60s, Calvary Chapel was or is a non, uh, I'm sorry, in the 1960s, this is when it began. Calvary Chapel is a non denominational Christian church that began in 1965 in Costa Mesa, California. Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa's pastor, Chuck Smith, became a leading figure in what is known as the Jesus Movement. In the 1970s, it has been estimated that in a two-year period in the mid-70s, Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa performed well over 8,000 baptisms. Isn't that amazing? During that same period, we were instrumental in 20,000 conversions to, Christ, to the Christian faith. A remarkable pattern kept repeating itself. As soon as we moved into a new building, as we know, Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa was already too big for their facilities. In two years, they moved from the original building, which was one of the first church buildings in Costa Mesa, to a rented Lutheran church overlooking the Pacific. Soon thereafter, as he says, that they decided to do something unprecedented at the time and move the church to a school that they had bought. 
The building did not match up to code, so we tore it down and built another. But by the time the sanctuary of 330 seats was completed in 1969, they were already forced to go to two services and eventually they had to use the outside courtyard for 500 more seats. An amazing movement of the Spirit of God through Calvary Chapel. Uh, Costa Mesa as uh, with the lead pastor, Pastor Chuck Smith. But by 1971, the large crowds and winter rains forced us to move again. He says that we bought a 10-acre tract of land on the Costa Mesa Santa Ana border. Orange County was quickly changing and the once famous Orange Orchards were, moving, were making way for the exploding population of Los Angeles. Soon after buying the land, we again did the unprecedented and erected a giant circus tent that could seat 1,600 at a stretch. This soon enlarged to hold 2,000 seats. Meanwhile, we began building an, an enormous sanctuary adja adjacent to this site. By the time Calvary Chapel had celebrated opening day in 1973, moving into the vast new sanctuary of 2,200 seats, the building was already too small to contain the numbers turning out. We held three Sunday morning services and had more than 4,000 people at each one. Many had to sit on the carpeted floor. A large portion of the floor space was left without pews so as to provide the option. Now moving into the 1980s, Calvary Chapel also ministers over the airways and this must account for many of those who travel long distances to fellowship here. A Nielsen survey indicated that our Sunday services as Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa is speaking of themselves here, that our Sunday morning Calvary Chapel service is the most listened to program in the area during the entire week. As of 1987, Calvary Chapel's outreach has included numerous radio program, television broadcasts, and the production and distribution of tapes and records. The missions outreach is considerable. Calvary Chapel not only supports Wycliffe Bible Translators, Campus Crusades, Missionary Aviation Fellowship, and other groups, but we donate to third world needs. We then built a radio program in San Salvador and gave it to the local pastors there. We also gave money to open doors to pur purchase the ship that in tandem with a barge delivered 1 million Bibles to mainland China. Our financial commitment to missions exceeds the local expense budget by over 50%. The last um, updates we have were from 2010. Uh, Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa, the church which only had 25 members, has grown to a fellowship of approximately 1,500 churches worldwide and has been listed as one of the 10 largest Protestant churches in the U.S. Let's go now into the third section, the church that belongs to Jesus. So it is his ministry, his church, and his message, his ministry. First and foremost, it's all about Jesus. We always got to remember that. Here at New Beginnings, we continually remind everyone that it's all about Jesus. It's his church. His ministry, as Paul described his ministry at Corinth, he declared, For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your bondservants for Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5. The new covenant ministry is all about the gospel of Jesus. We are made sufficient for this ministry by the empowering of the Holy Spirit that gives life unto the Mosaic law that kills Man's efforts for man's glory don't bring life. Remember, we're not the one that brings life. It's Jesus that gives and brings life. And he says that if you believe in him, you will have life. And not only just a regular life, but an abundant life. Resolve that it is his church, his mission, his grace, and that it is for his glory and not your own. Remember, it's all about Him. We do everything for the glory of God, for the glory of the Lord, and not for the glory of us, the church, or anyone in that ministry. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7 says that we are simply earthen, earthen vessels that the excellence of power may be of God and not of us. Let's talk about His church now. We talk about His ministry. Let's talk about His church. Jesus used the term church twice. 
In Matthew 16, 18, he says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not overcome it. In other words, the Lord affirmed that it is his church and he is the source of growth. He did not propose a methodology, but declared authority over his church. Remember, as we are told in Psalm 127, verse, verse 1, unless the Lord builds a house, the builders labor in vain. The gospel is an obstacle to people for a host of, of reasons. So there will be temptation to make the message more palatable to people by minimizing or obscuring the commandments, teachings, and life of Jesus. So make sure that you are committed to trusting Jesus to build his church rather than relying on any methodology that would minimize his rightful place. You know what, when we begin churches, we begin to get all these mailings and these uh, uh, articles and just these individuals that are sending us information as to how to build our church. We don't do that. As we are reminded here that uh, we are committed to relying on the prince on 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 the word of god the principles that he teaches us we are trusting jesus to build his church we don't want any methods to build the church we don't want to buy any 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 articles or 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 programs on building the church all we want to do is make sure that it is built on his word by his spirit Remember, whatever you strive to gain, you'll need to strive to maintain. If you push and press pressure to gain it in your own strength, you'll have to you'll have the burden of maintaining it in your strength. Man-made works are a heavy burden, but we know that Jesus' load is very light and it brings rest to our souls. The second a uh, portion of scripture where the Lord mentions his church. It's in Matthew 18, verse 17, where he says, if an, uh, if an admonished brother refuses to receive correction, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, treat him as you would a pagan or tax collector. In other words, Jesus affirms his protection and the purification of his church. Pastors who feel threatened about the growth or decline of the church are likely to consider you using methodologies that are contrary to Jesus's plan for his church. Fundamentally, we must decide that it is Jesus's church and his mission. So we decide to do ministry his way. Okay. How do we do that? We give forth his message, his word. Focus on Jesus. He is the whole gospel. His person, offices, and work must be our one great all comprehending theme as Charles Spurgeon says preach Christ always and everywhere and of course he stated what I just mentioned now all the Bible focuses on Jesus all of the Bible focuses on Jesus either predictive of his work preparatory of his work reflective of his work and or resultant of his work Brian Campbell Christ Center preaching the gospel is rooted in, G in Jesus from Genesis chapter 1 to Revelation chapter 22. His promise, person, or word. And Jesus isn't saying, let me show you how to live, but rather, let me show you why I die. Awesome. We know that there are counterfeits to Christ-centered preaching, like moralism, relativism, self-helpism, and activism. Moralism suggests that we appease God's wrath towards sin with our good deeds. The focus becomes good works. Relativism is the idea that truth is self-determined and we approach God in the way that seems best to us. In essence, we create our own God and obey our own laws. A departure from God's commandment is characteristics in relativism. self Self-helpism appeals to the will by challenging people to apply biblical principles without necessarily applying the gospel to their hearts. Christ becomes more of an example than a savior. And then finally, activism. Activism emphasizes the social gospel and tends to produce cause-oriented rather than Christ-centered people like 
the Salvation Army, what it's become today, as well as the YMCA. Attempts to affect social change without change of heart or nature. Caring for the poor, just like some of these institutions, is very important, but it should not be divorced from Jesus and man's greatest need, which is salvation. Lastly, we're going to talk about the book of Acts as our model. This is the fourth section that we'll be concluding with today. It says that the new early church described in Acts is holistic in that it has sound doctrine, sound devotion, genuine community, evangelistic passion, and meaningful social justice. The church as described in the book of Acts is presumed to be our model for the church because it was established by the apostles selected by Jesus. It has a record, it has a record of being extremely effective in performing Jesus' mission and the majority of the seven churches of Revelation chapter 2 and 3. And we know that he admonished uh, uh, and corrected uh, a number of them, but two were actually just commended. And so we know that in the last 60 years, the church has generally departed from the blueprint and was rebuked by Jesus as we covered in Revelation. And for us that are going through Revelation, you know, this is what we shared with all of you and taught you all. Again, as he says, the book of Acts is a model for our church. Remember in the statement of faith, how I read to you that uh, the book of Acts gives us uh, the model for our church. This is our statement of faith. This is what we believe in. The next thing that we're going to talk about now is sound doctrine. We give sound doctrine. It means that the church emphasizes really the word of God. And the teaching is consistent with orthodox theology. Each of the writers of the New Testament opposes false doctrine, whether it is the Pharisees' legalism, the Gnosticism, liberalism, or the Sadducees' failure to recognize spiritual reality. The next thing we're going to uh, talk about here for you is a strong devotion involves prayer, worship, and the work of the Holy Spirit. The early church as described in Acts chapter 2 verses 42 to 47, it says that it continued to emphasize prayer and worship. The church, remember this, was birthed by the Holy Spirit there on the day of Pentecost. And the apostles were keenly aware of Jesus' admonition to wait for the power of the Holy Spirit. The early church understood that effective church requires the work of the Holy Spirit. Jesus promised expanding influence if the Holy Spirit was empowering the church. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 talked about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And we'll go into that in the future. As the church of Antioch ministered to the Lord through worship, prayer, and the word, the Holy Spirit directed and guided and empowered the expansion of God's kingdom as Barnabas and Saul were sent out to begin New Testament churches. The Holy Spirit inspires through faith adventures. Too often church leaders pursue a radical idea birthed by the intellect or the flesh rather than the Holy Spirit. So let's talk about this. Let's go into the next section and we'll, we'll mention this. We'll, we'll definitely begin to talk about this. It says, the need to start and finish in the church. The church must not only begin in the spirit, but needs to continue and end in the spirit. Assuming your church begins in the spirit and experiences expanding influence, there will be a temptation. It's a natural temptation to neglect the work of the spirit. The danger of success is a tendency to confuse momentum and emotion with the work of the Holy Spirit. Where the Spirit is moving, there is life transformation. That is so key. You will see people coming into your church and it will confirm that the Holy Spirit is working when their lives are being transformed. We have many people coming into our church and we see this happening today. People's lives are radically transformed. Basically, the Lord is restoring what the locusts have eaten and made them now into new creations and you see lives radically transformed. And that is when you know that the Spirit is working. Look for this as you hear people, as you communicate with people. Listen to what's happening in them. Allow them to willfully give them their give you their testimony. And this is what I've been seeing is how people would just come up to me and begin to share with me how the Lord is transforming and how the Holy Spirit is empowering them and working through them. It's just an amazing, beautiful to, 
thing to see. And that's when you know that the Lord and his spirit is working. It says there that uh, church history reveals a life cycle in a local church or movement of God. Movements become monoliths as the spirit of God is neglected and routine and ritual replace power and anointing. As Paul warned the Galatians, it is foolish to believe that we can improve upon the power of the Spirit by the works of the flesh. Remember what he said in Galatians chapter 3, verse 3, having begun in the Spirit, are you, made, are you being made perfect by the flesh? Something to think about. Let's remain again just uh, in the Spirit, allowing the Spirit to move in and through us, baptizing, filling, overflowing your people. And so let's keep reading. Uh, he says here, community involves authentic relationship experience in the context of smaller groups. We know that the early church grew expositionally, exponentially so that there were soon several thousand. Remember, 3,000 when Peter gave that sermon came to the Lord. Then 2,000 later, there were 5,000 believers an amazing movement of the Spirit of God. And I pray that this continues and that there would be again this type of movement that we see in our lifetime. They continue to daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, Acts 2.46. They emphasize the teaching of the doctrine and worship. I'm sorry, in addition to emphasizing teaching doctrine and worship as a larger group, the early church was intentional to develop community in the context of smaller groups. The early church shared the resources so that those in need would be cared for. Acts chapter 4, verse 32 through 37 talks about authentic relationships, how to identify physical, emotional, and spiritual needs that the members of the community can care for. Genuine community and authentic relationships are often experienced in the context of smaller groups that promote biblical fellowship, koinonia fellowship, sharing togetherness and oneness in the life of Christ, Doctrine, fellowship, prayer, gathering, and sharing a meal. Evangelistic passion. The early church sought to seek and save the lost without compromising biblical truth or avoiding the primary issues of sin, confession, repentance, and faith in Christ. The results were what? Exponential growth. Missionary vision. The early church was outward focused and sought to fulfill the Great Commission. We must remain outwardly focused. This is what we do. This is what we want to do. And we just, you know what? The Lord will raise up people in our church with, that are able to do this. And we ourselves as pastors must be encouraging this within our body. And you will see God moving if we have this passion to reach the lost. Let's look at the final section, meaningful social justice. The Acts Church was concerned for and proposed to influence and minister to tangible needs of its community. In Jerusalem, the church provided benevolence in the form of a program to feed needy widows. It provided opportunities to show the love of God in tangible ways to establish new leaders and create a bridge for pre-believers to know the Lord. The result, then the word of God spread and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. Acts chapter 6, verse 7. Not only did the church grow exponentially, but even priests, perhaps the least likely to come to the faith, they actually came to Christ. Community service will always have an active, attractive quality and should supplement a teaching ministry of the church, not to replace it. Remember, the apostles sought to delegate oversight of the community service to others so that they could Continue to prioritize the word of God and prayer. Acts 6, verse 1 through 4. Remember, they chose the, second de uh, the, the seven demons, uh, the, the sec seven deacons there. And this is so important for us as leaders, as the church planners, that will be the pastors, the under shepherds. Our responsibility is to pray, to teach, to disciple. We need to raise up other leaders, as we talked about previously. I'm sorry, other people, other individuals that will we will see them growing into leaders of the church. They are the ones to handle these things. They are the ones to to serve in the tables. They are the ones to to do this additional work that is important to allow the church to function as it was intended to function. 
But our priority as pastors, as leaders, is to pray, to teach, to study, to disciple. These are the critical things that we are called to do. Things that we should not neglect, but that we should focus on. Well, I hope you were blessed by uh, by this. Next week, we're going to talk about, or next time, I keep saying next week, I think it's because of our church services, but next time we uh, that you tune into the next uh, section, and we will talk about the emphasis of teaching the Bible, uh, worship, and of course, the ministry of, of the Holy Spirit and the gifts. And if we have time, we'll talk about church government. So with that, I leave you. God bless you. And we'll see you next time. Bye now.